Well, good morning, Cedar Grove. Uh, today is fifth Sunday. On our church property this morning, we are having two opportunities for worship. Outside of the online service, we are having a drive-in worship. And that is starting right now. And also at 10 o'clock this morning, we had our first walk-in service since all of this COVID-19 shelter-in-place began. It's a measured opening. It is um, being very calculated and how many we can seat in the building. But we started our first walk-in and over these last 10 weeks. And also we're continuing the drive-in service. So we hope and pray that throughout these months that you have taken time to draw near to God and hopefully that you will find that God has been there all the while for you. You know, today's message, and you see on the screen behind me, is that it's about this whole idea of hypocrisy. And no one likes hypocrisy unless you like movies. Because see, movies is where hypocrisy is best portrayed. I met a guy this week at a campground down in Florida. I pulled our camper down there for Lori and the grand girls. And, and uh, as I was hooking up and uh, unhooking, actually, this gentleman came out of his camper beside me. Very nice man from St. Louis, uh, getting ready to leave to go back to St. Louis. And he was telling me a little bit about his life later on that afternoon. He talked about when his wife died, when she was 54 years of age. And shortly thereafter, his son died. And then he was left with a daughter, and then she died. In fact, she died just a couple of months ago. So he just took some time to come away and to go camping. So as we were talking, and one thing led to another, he told me about being in Arizona last year and meeting Matthew McConaughey. They camped side by side. And he looked at me and he said, you know, he's not that guy you see on TV. He is really a genuine guy. You know, the deal with Matthew McConaughey is that obviously he is a real person, but yet he is not the character he plays on TV. In actuality, he is who he is. Hypocrisy, on the other hand, is when we become something that we really are not. It's when we play a charade or walk through a game and we act like one thing and we do another thing. It reminds me of a story I heard about a father who, with his family, went to church and on the way to church, they fussed about how they were running late. They walked into the building and, and they sat through the service. No sooner than they walked out and got in the car, the father started fussing about the sermon, fussing about the air conditioning in the church, fussing about the music, fussing about everything. On his way home from church, he fussed about the traffic. He got home and dinner was not ready like he thought it should be. So he started fussing about the meal. And then that meal was served and the family sat around the table and this little boy observing everything his dad had done that day, the father said, son, family, let's pray and thank God for the meal. So he prayed and he prayed and he ended his prayer in Jesus' name, amen. The little boy, inquisitive as he was, looked up at the father and said, father, did God hear you when you were criticizing the preacher this morning? And the father said, Yes, son, I guess he did. Well, Father, did God hear you when you were fussing on the way home about the music and about the traffic? And the Father said, Yes, son, I guess he sure did. Well, Father, did God hear you when you prayed and thanked him for the meal today? And the Father looked at the son and he said, Son, actually, he sure did. And then the little boy did what only the little boy could do. He asked his father, he says, Father, which one do you think he believes? The praying one or the fussing one? 
See, hypocrisy is everywhere, isn't it? Hypocrisy in the church is everywhere. It's rampant. It's the 21st century norm, right? Where you can be something at home and then something else at church. Or you can be something else at work and something else at church. See, that's hypocrisy. That is someone who wears a mask. That is someone who's putting on a show, demonstrating something that you want people to believe that you are. When the truth be known, down deep in your heart of hearts, you know that you're not. You're just playing a part. So today, today's text, we're going to look at just 13 verses of Scripture found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. And quickly, we're going to walk through these today. The Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. They observed that some of his disciples were eating bread with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not even eat, do not eat unless they have given their hands a ceremonial washing, keeping the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they have washed. And they are many other customs that they have received and kept, like the washing of the cups and the pitchers and the kettles and the dining couches. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating bread with ceremony unclean hands? And Jesus answered them, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites as it is written the people honors me with their lips but their heart is far from me they worship me in vain teaching as doctrines human commands abandoning the command of God you hold on to human traditions he also said to them you have a fine way of invalidating God's command in order to set up your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of the father and mother must be put to death. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother, whatever benefit you might have received from me is Corban. That is an offering devoted to God. You no longer let him do anything his father or, or do for his father or his mother. You nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many other similar things. You can take these first 13 verses of Mark chapter 7, and you can see full well what the setting is. Jesus has performed all of these miraculous things. And everybody's wanting to pin something on Jesus. And the one thing that they're pinning on Jesus was that he had some followers that were eating with hands that were ceremonially, in their eyes, unclean. Because as it was for the scribes and the Pharisees, they were the legalists of that day. They were the people who held stronger to man's traditions than God's word. They did what they felt like was right or what their fathers told them was right instead of what God said was right. So they came against Jesus. And in so coming against Jesus, they came to him to talk about the tragic curse that so many people in that first century faced as they do in the 21st century. And that is the curse of legalism. That is doing things on the outside with no intention of being made clean on the inside. See, salvation in Christ Jesus is this. We come to faith in Christ and we come to him not on pretense. We're not saved by our feelings. We're not saved by our goodness. We're not saved by random acts of kindness. We come to him by faith and faith alone in Christ and Christ alone. And therefore, we are saved. And something happens at that very moment. We are justified. We are put in a right standing before God. And there at that very moment, 
We are saved by grace through faith. That not of ourselves, it becomes a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, that's how easy legalism happens. Because before we know it, people can be drawn to a feeling. Or it can be drawn to crossing a T or dotting an I or doing traditional things that our fathers have done. And we just presuppose that if I do these in the right sequence of order, then therefore I can be made right with God. No, the truth be known is that legalism, as it is, is nothing more than hypocrisy. It is playing a charade. It is doing things on the outside that doesn't happen because something changed on the inside. It's doing things on the outside so the people will be drawn to what they see. You see, the fact of the matter is that when God looks at your heart, it's like when God looks at my heart, God sees us as we really are. That's what happened with these scribes and Pharisees. They showed up to Jesus. They were condemning Jesus' followers. They were saying that how could they truly be followers of yours when they do not wash their hands like they should? It wasn't that they were washing their, not washing their hands. It was the fact that they were not doing it to the specifications of the legalists of that day. See, the Torah in the Bible, the Word of God, the Talmud is the rabbinical writings. The Mishnah is other writings. It's almost like in Jesus' day, the relig religious leaders had built fences all around the Word of God, and they were the ones who determined what was right and what was wrong. It was the fathers, their forefathers, that determined right and wrong. It was not the Word of God. And the Bible says that when they came to Jesus and they said those things, and he said, isn't that exactly what Isaiah prophesied? Isaiah said, he says, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And then this is how they worship. They worship me in vain. What is vain worship? Vain worship is not doing the right thing in worship. It is worshiping the right way and maybe not worshiping the true God. See, the, the, the whole problem with idol worship, that you can be sincere in worshiping an idol, but that doesn't mean the idol's correct. Or you can be not sincere in worshiping the one true God and nullifies that worship because you worshiped the right God and you've done it in the wrong way. Isaiah said, this is what Jesus said to them. Isaiah was right. You honor me. He says, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is not there. Your heart is far away from me. You're doing it on the outside. Nothing is happening on the inside that causes the outside to act differently. You're just doing it for doing its sake. And then he said, he said, they worship me in vain. In vain what? In vain teaching as doctrines, human commands. In other words, they're elevating what man has said above what God has said. He uses that passage where Moses talks about, it, the scripture gives us that one of the Ten Commandments, to honor your father and your mother. And it tells us about doing that, we can live long in this life. But yet they came up with the word. The word is called Corbin. It's the word that simply states that if you know that your mother and father has a need, you can declare Corbin, meaning that you don't have to help them because whatever you have has been devoted to God. Or maybe even devoted for what you think is devoted to God. So the way out of helping your mother and father is by just saying Corbin. And Jesus was saying to them, 
How foolish could you be? You reject the word of God over the traditions of man. In other words, what your forefathers have said is more important than what God has said. Now I can tell you that in this 21st century, we've gone through a lot of traditions and chewed them up, and many of them, we spit them out. But it took a long time to do it. For instance, there are traditions such as that men could wear hats to church. Little did I realize that that, that happened when John Calvin, who was a part of the Reformation, would go into church and he would wear his hat in the church. And when he would pray, he would take off his hat to pray. And when John Calvin did that, he started a tradition. And a lot of men in the Presbyterian church and, and would start wearing their hats to church. And when they would pray, they'd take off their hat. Little did they know till later on in life, after they read about his biography, that the only reason he did that is because in some of those hallowed, open air, cold down places called cathedrals. That hiding out in the lofts, unknown to the human eye, were tweeting little pigeons up there. And John Calvin wore his hat into the church to keep from a pigeon bombing him on top of his head. And when people found out about that, they realized that, hey, we just followed him. And what he did, we mimicked it. And what was it? It was a tradition. So you look back in the Catholic Church, for instance, tradition. Tradition over Scripture. When the Pope is sitting in his papal chair, he is infallible. Is that in the Word of God? No, it's not in the Word of God. It is tradition. It is papal authority. It is papal infallibility. So what happened? Not in the word of God. But yet they chose it as a tradition. In the Baptist church, we have traditions. We don't smoke. We don't chew. And we don't go out with girls that do. It used to be that women could not wear slacks out in public. And that men, when they came to church, they had to always have a tie on. Or you never danced nowhere. And the fact of the matter is that a lot of those traditions was nothing more than just ways that we could show ourselves to be superior with others. Why do I go to church? I go to church. Some people, because they feel like that is just a notch on their spiritual belt. I go, I go to church. I go every time the door is open. I don't watch pornography. I don't do all of those other things. I'm doing everything right. I'm keeping everything by the letter of the tradition. But yet we're not saved by tradition. We're saved by a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why when someone says, I prayed that prayer. What prayer? That prayer that asks Jesus to forgive me and cleanse me of my sin. And therefore, I must be a Christian because I prayed that prayer. See, that's tradition. The fact is that you're not saved by praying a prayer. If that is true, every person that has ever been to war has prayed. Every person that has ever been in jail that has prayed. Every person that has ever been sick that has prayed is saved. See, the fact of the matter is that we're not saved by words that we say, and that's it. We're saved when we transfer our life into the hands of the one who knows us and loves us. And he saves us. And the way we know we are his, he comes to live within us. In the life that we live now, we live as unto him because he makes all the difference in our life. Jesus changes everything. So I met Frank as he was helping me as I backed up my camper, stood outside, we were talking. And as it kind of gradually began to turn from Matthew McConaughey to 
him telling me that he lived in St. Louis and before he told me about his wife and his children that were deceased. I asked Frank, I said, Frank, just curious. We'll probably never see each other. You're leaving tomorrow and I'm leaving tomorrow. We'll probably never see each other again. Just curious, Frank. If something happened to you today, do you have that peace and that assurance that you'd go to heaven? And if so, why? And for just a few moments, this man who retired insurance agent, this man who obviously has done very well for himself financially in his life, he's made the plan and he's worth the plan. And yet he's retired. He looked at me. An intellectual man. A man that had obviously thought through this process before. He said, to be honest with you, I think that everything's good with me and God. Because shortly after my wife married, she was a band director at a school, in the middle school. And a little Methodist church was starting up. And my wife, who was a former majorette, a band director, and all of that, she was asked by the young pastor if she would come and just play the organ during the service. And she did for six months. And I think that God looks at that. And God says, that, that is enough. See, a lot of things was wrong with what Frank was determining. He was thinking that maybe 40 years ago, for six months of their life in a little Methodist church was sufficient to get to heaven. And the truth be known, and as I shared with Frank, and as I shared my own story, is that there is a way that seemeth right to man, but the end result will be absolute disappointment. Because the way to Jesus Christ is a personal relationship. It's not hypocrisy. It is not playing a charade. It is not cowing down to man's tradition but it's lifting high the scripture of the word of God and saying, God, by your word and according to your word, I have trusted my whole life to you. And you in turn have forgiven me. And I am saved by that faith. Not man's tradition, not by my feelings, but by my faith in the resurrected, risen Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, could it be today that reading through those first 13 verses of Mark chapter 7, we can see easily how people could be drawn to worshiping you or saying things that they think that you would like to hear with their lips. But their heart their heart doesn't belong to you. Lord, what is true in me? What is true in Frank that I met this week? What is true in each and every person that walks on this planet? That there is only one way to salvation. And that is through a personal relationship with Christ. There's not enough rules that are enough to get us home. We don't wash our hands enough to get home. We may wash enough to keep from getting a virus or COVID-19, but ceremonially washing of our hands and trying to live by the letter of man's tradition is not enough. We need a personal relationship with Jesus and we have that when we put all our trust in Christ and not in ourselves. help us to do just that today in Jesus name